بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته The Quran is the word of Allah عز وجل This is from Allah the Almighty Nothing in it Not even a single letter Is from other than Allah the Almighty Now in order for us to understand the Quran It is not something that one can do without thoroughly pondering upon it. Allah says in the Quran, this is a book which we have sent down to you full of blessings that they may ponder over its verses and that man of understanding may remember. So we know that it is blessed and blessing comes only from Allah Azza wa Jal. He is the source of blessings. And this book is blessed because it is from Allah. And the blessing is displayed when you recite it. You can see the blessing in your life. You can see the blessing in the tranquility you find in your heart. You can see the blessings of the Quran and the peace you enjoy in life. But it was revealed so that the men would ponder upon it these verses and how would I ponder well this is the essence of the science known as a tafsir tafsir al Quran means in simple English explaining the Quran and one would say do I have to have someone explain the Quran to me and the answer is yes because this is from Allah the Almighty in general terms, everyone can understand it. So, verses like, do not approach fornication. Anyone on the street, when I tell him this, he says, okay, illegal sexual acts are forbidden in Islam. When Allah says that gambling and intoxicants, etc., are all the works of shaitan, of Satan, so stay away, refrain from it. Anyone on the streets, even if he's not a rocket scientist, even if he's a layman, or even an illiterate, would listen to it and say, okay, it's prohibited for Muslims to gamble and to consume intoxicants. When Allah says, worship him and do not associate others with him, anyone would know that if you say that Jesus is the son of God, or he's a one out of three, then he knows that this is associating others with God. This is shirk. So we believe in the Quran. However, there are some technical aspects that need scholars to explain. And that is why Allah says, Fas'alu ahl dhikr Ask those of remembrance, those of knowledge, if you do not know. So you have to ask. The Prophet told us in so many places that you have to ask. Therefore, the science of tafsir is one of the greatest sciences of Islam. And sciences of Islam are divided into two types. Types that are known as sciences of the tools or the equipment. And what is that? Are we into mechanics? No. See. To understand Islam, there are auxiliary, supplementary sciences that are not studied 
for their own sake that would draw you closer to Allah, but rather to help you understand what draws you closer to Allah. For example, Arabic language. If a student studies Arabic, is he studying something that is leading him to Jannah? The answer is no. We have Jews and Christians studying Arabic. It would not lead them to Jannah, definitely. If you study the science of Tajweed, of how to recite the Quran, and how to say the Ghunna, and the Ikhfa, and the different aspects of Tajweed, again, this is not meant for itself, but it helps to perfect your recitation of the Quran. The grammatical and the linguistics of Arabic. Again, this helps, but it is not intended for itself. Tafsir, the commentary, the explanation of the Quran, this is meant for itself. It is a science that leads you straight to Allah Azza wa Jal. Why is that? Because it studies the meanings of the Quran. What is not so clear to the people and what is meant by its verses it studies the rulings of the quran what is halal and what is haram it explains what happened to the previous generations and it is giving you the glad tidings of what awaits you in paradise and it threatens the disbelievers of what awaits them in hellfire it is a description of Allah the Almighty. How would we know Allah the Almighty if it weren't for this noble Quran? Allah Azza wa Jal is describing Himself to us in the Quran. So we know that He is glorified the Almighty, that He is praiseworthy, that He is all seeing, all hearing. We know that He is over His throne on the seventh heaven, over paradise. We know that he is the most high, the exalted. Nothing is over him, the Almighty. We know that he is so powerful and so great. All of this we find in the Quran. So the science of tafsir is the most of all sciences in elevation and priority. Allah Azza wa Jal has told us, I've revealed the Quran for you to ponder upon the verses. So your first priority is to know what the Qur'an is. And it also gives you a lot of confidence when you recite the Qur'an and try to implement it. Because just simply the recitation of the Qur'an and pondering upon it is not something to be praised if you're not going to implement it. So someone who recites the Qur'an, someone who understands the Qur'an, but still involves in riba, uses interest money, usually, and he fornicates, and he consumes intoxicants. Someone who recites the Qur'an and knows the tafsir of each and every ayah, but he still lies, he cheats, he backbites, he does cruel things and evil things, then this is not sufficient. So the science of tafsir gives you the meanings. It leads you to the way, but you have to walk the talk and you have to implement this in your life. And that is why the companions of the Prophet والسلام, as was narrated by their students, they said that they used to tell us that we as the companions of the Prophet وسلم, used to learn 10 verses of the Qur'an and would not go to the following 10 until we understand the meaning of these 10 verses, implement them in our lives and have a strong conviction in them. Then we move on to learning the following 10 verses. And that is why it was reported that Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, one of the great scholars of the companions, he memorized and perfected chapter 2, Surah Al-Baqarah, in eight years. And this is astonishing because people can memorize the Surah in, let's say, a couple of weeks. 
but he took eight years because he pondered upon each and every verse and he implemented that in his life so it's not the knowledge that is sufficient it is what you do with that knowledge because this is what you will be held accountable for on the day of judgment and Abdullah bin Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, said to one of his companions, Today, you are among a lot of knowledgeable people and few that recite the Qur'an. Few qaris. But soon you will see a time where you have few knowledgeable people, few scholars and plenty of qaris. And this is a fact. So now... If you look at what we have today, we have few scholars and a lot of qaris. Beautiful recitations, beautiful ways of leading the taraweeh, etc. However, when you look in depth, you would find that they're not implementing it. They're not walking the talk. One minute, he's a beautiful qari reciting the Quran. The second minute, with a musical band, and singing and chanting and what kind of Quran is this you carry in your chest. So what Abdullah bin Mas'ud said is totally correct and we have to go back to square one in order for us to get the benefit and to get the most of this beautiful and glorious Quran. We have a short break. Stay tuned and we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. So, when we look at the different texts, the different hadiths, we get an understanding of what we should do. A man once said to Abdullah bin Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, he said, I recite Al Mufassal in one rak'ah. And Abdullah bin Mas'ud told him that you do this. As if you're reading poetry? No, this is not the way it should be done. The Prophet has warned us from people reciting the Quran, it does not exceed their throats. But what's beneficial from reciting the Quran is what remains in the heart and one benefits of it. So going back to the previous issue, what is most important, to recite as many as you can from the Qur'an or to ponder upon the verses? Well, Allah has revealed the Qur'an to be pondered upon. Yet, reciting it without pondering also is rewardable. But scholars made a comparison and they said that if you ponder upon the Qur'an as if you have precious jewel and you give it for the sake of Allah. And if you recite many verses of the Qur'an without pondering, as if you have some silver and gold coins and you give it for the sake of Allah. So the coins are a lot, but the value of that single jewel is more precious and more valuable. And that is why we have to try and combine the two. We have to try and recite as much as we can, but still have few verses to ponder upon. Now, Abdullah bin Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him. And we always uh, mention his name simply because he was known to be among the four that the Prophet ﷺ instructed us to take the Quran from. So, Ubay ibn Ka'ab, Abdullah bin Mas'ud, ibn Um Abd, the Prophet called him. He was so knowledgeable in the Quran to the extent that the Prophet ﷺ, no matter where or when the Qur'an was revealed to him, Abdullah bin Mas'ud knew that. And he said, I took so many verses straight from the mouth of the Prophet ﷺ. I took so many surahs. And there is no single ayah or verse in the Qur'an that was revealed, except I would know when it was revealed and what is the reason it was revealed for. And that is why his knowledge of the Qur'an is so great. May Allah be pleased with him. He says that do not recite and spread the Qur'an as if you're doing with the bad dates. 
So when you have good dates and bad dates, you usually spread them around so that you can collect the good one and leave the bad one away. He's saying that don't do this with the Quran. And you have to avoid reciting it as you're reciting poetry. You have to stop chanting like as if you are reading poetry without pondering upon it. You have to ponder upon its miracles. You have to move people's hearts with the Quran. And you should not only care about the last part of the surah. So, for example, if the Imam says in the beginning, then I know the surah, so I know exactly when it's going to end, and I know whether salah is going to be long or short. Now, this means that I am not concentrating on the salah, rather I'm anticipating when it's over. And this shows you that I do not have any taste for the Qur'an, and there's no pondering upon the verses. What should happen is, I should concentrate and focus on every single verse so that my heart would benefit from it. And when I hear the Fatiha being recited, I benefit from it. When I say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, or when I hear it, I know that all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of the Dominion, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So my heart is filled with it. Not, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, just try to get it over with. And the Prophet ﷺ has warned us not to be like the Khawarij. The Kharijites, or the Khawarij as they're known, they are a sect, they are a cult that pretend to be Muslims, they pretend to have good intention, but they do devastating things that are totally against Islam. Nowadays, we know the Khawarij to be the extremists, those who are terrorists, though blow up people, they would overthrow governments, they would give takfir to anyone who does not follow their methodology. The Prophet told us that they will come at the end of time and they'll recite the Quran, but it would not exceed their throats, so they would not benefit. It's just sounds and mumbling that they're doing, but it has no benefit or no value to them or to the people. And the Prophet told us that they leave Islam as fast as an arrow penetrates a game and it goes away from it. And they kill the people of Islam and they leave the people of idol worshippers. They claim to be Muslims, but they're killing Muslims. So their claim is greatly challenged. And that is why reciting the Quran by itself is not sufficient. You have to ponder. You have to know what your Lord wants from you so that you would benefit the most and implement what Allah Azza wa Jal tells you to do this. And if you look at how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to recite the Quran, you would understand. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's moral conduct was the Quran, as Mother Aisha tells us. And this means that he pondered upon every single ayah and he's the only one who understands exactly what Allah meant by each and every ayah because it was revealed to him. Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, may Allah be pleased with him and with his father. He said, I saw the Prophet once and he wanted to pray night prayer. So I stood next to him and I said, I'll pray with him night prayer. He started beginning to recite from chapter 2, Al-Baqarah. And this is the longest surah in the Quran. So I said to myself, he's going to recite a hundred verses of it. And then that would be a rak'ah, a unit. But the Prophet continued until he finished it. And then he began with Surah An-Nisa, chapter 4, until he finished it. And then he began with chapter 3, Al-Imran, until he finished it. Three of the longest surahs of the Quran in one rak'ah. Not only that, Hudayfa says, whenever the Prophet ﷺ recited these three surahs, he was slow in reciting it, pondering upon it. Whenever he passed by an, a verse that has praising of Allah and glorification of Allah, he used to glorify Allah. And whenever he passed by a verse that encouraged people to ask Allah for his grace and favor and mercy, 
he would ask Allah for his paradise and his mercy. And whenever he passed by an ayah of torment and punishment, he would seek refuge in Allah from such torment and punishment. And this is how the Prophet ﷺ used to deal with the word of Allah, the Almighty, Azza wa Jal. And this is logical. If you have a book in medicine or in engineering, you would definitely expect the professor to explain it to you. Because not everyone is capable of going through it and understanding it cover to cover. And that is why the role of the scholars is to explain, to interpret, to comment on these beautiful verses of the glorious Quran so that they would draw the people closer to Allah the Almighty and to explain what is not understood by them and to make it clear. And one would say, why would we need this if the Quran was revealed for all humanity? Well, that's a good question. You need this because Allah Azza wa Jal has created people different in their intellect and in their understanding. You would not expect a rocket scientist to be a neurosurgeon because he has his field and that person has his own field. You cannot expect a dentist to be an expert in car repairs or a mechanic to be an expert in tooth repair, for example. Each one Allah has given him the knowledge that is suitable to his intellect and understanding. And that is why this noble Qur'an, this glorious Qur'an, has to be studied thoroughly, has to be made easy for people to understand and for people to ponder upon. And it is the number one priority on any student of knowledge list. It would be unfortunate to see a student of knowledge who's knowledgeable in hadith, who's knowledgeable in fiqh, who's knowledgeable in different sciences of Islam, but when it comes to tafsir, when it comes to explaining the verses of the Quran, he has zero knowledge. You cannot get closer to Allah Azza wa Jal without understanding the book of Allah. And the more you study it, the more Allah would open doors, close doors for you that you thought would never get opened. The more you ponder upon it, the more you devote time to it, a lot of knowledge in other sciences, in Arabic, in fiqh, in aqidah, in usul, in every single part of the different Islamic sciences, they all originate and they all go back to this noble and glorious Quran. Now, this is what we will do, inshallah, in future segments of this program. We will try our level best to have an understanding of this noble Quran, yet it's not going to be easy. And I don't claim to be qualified to do this, but I'll try my level best so that we would try and strive to get closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. And by doing that, we may, with His grace and mercy, be entitled to be admitted to paradise. This is all the time we have. Until we meet next time, في أمان الله والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. هذا القرآن يوحدنا.